Welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. Quite often on the show, we're talking about how to raise one great crop. But you know what? How about if you want to raise two great crops? Today we're going to focus a little bit on coming out of one crop, going into a second crop. We typically call that double cropping. Well, you know, even within a single crop, Brian, we get to a certain point in the year and a lot of folks will say, well, I've done everything I can do and now I'm done. However, if your corn is getting to tassel, there are still some things you can do to influence yield. We're going to talk about tasseling time in corn. We've got a Weed of the Week coming up later in the show as well as an Iron Talk, but first, here's this week's Farm Basics. The corn we planted early February we have all good emergence. So far, we can't find any condition that the wheels haven't worked. I can just say that. Closing the seed trench behind the planter is essential to establishing yields in the fall. Introducing the Germinator Closing Wheel from Farm Shop MFG. Designed and built by a farmer who is tired of seeing poor stands because of uneven emergence, the Germinator is here to give your crop the strong start it needs for maximum yield. For more information, visit us at farmshopmfg.com. During our Farm Basics time each week, we will talk about something that is common to those of us who farm and maybe a little bit less common to you if you don't farm. Today, our focus is annual versus biennial versus a perennial plant, or for Darren and me, we'd just as soon talk about weeds. So annual, biennial, and perennial weeds. Well, we get interesting questions all throughout the year and even about our crops, Brian. Why are you talking about corn planting all the time? Do you have to plant every year? Yeah, you do. And the reason why is corn is an annual plant. Now with a crop like alfalfa, for example, that's a perennial plant. So that means it's going to live for multiple years. So you can plant it once and oftentimes farmers will hope to get three or four or five years worth of crop out of it before that alfalfa stand starts to thin out a little bit and they want to do something else. Then you get to biennial. So this is a two-year plant. It seems kind of weird that a plant would not be an annual, yet it would not be a perennial. It lives for two years, even over the course of a horrible winter, which we usually have in our geography, where the ground is frozen for six months out of the year. These plants somehow still survive, but they only survive just that one winter. So anyway, biennial plants, just a couple examples here, musk thistle or bull thistle, or I'd also throw out biennial wormwood sage that's become a big problem for us on our farm in some of our no-till and strip-till environments. Well, it certainly changes the strategy that you may have if you want to get something under control. So if you look at an annual weed, well, hey, I just can't let this thing go to seed. If I stop it from going to seed, no problem. It's probably not coming back next year. But if you've got a biennial, well, you may not even notice it out there. It may be like Brandon was talking about musk thistle in a rosette, really close to the ground, out in a pasture, and the grass is a foot tall, and you don't notice, oh, there's a little spot out there where the grass isn't growing as well. Well, there's a rosette of a musk thistle. You've got to get that thing under control now because in year two, it's going to bolt and try and produce seed. So the big thing with these weeds is you have to stop them from getting to seed and then you can keep them from becoming a long-term problem. And then when we talk about perennial weeds, they can also spread by rhizomes below the soil surface. So that can be a real problem because you might go out there and say, well, I don't want to use any herbicides. I'm just going to use tillage. Well, you know what? Your perennial weed loves that. They are thankful that you're doing tillage because now you've spread that weed out over even more area and all those little shoots that are below ground, they will produce new plants and they might split off entirely from that original plant that, w that got started. Well, a great example of that would be quack grass in lawns. It's a perennial weed and you say, well, I got a weed out there. I'm just going to keep mowing it each week and try to stop it from going to seed. Nope, it puts out rhizomes and the patch just grows and grows and grows. And if you try and do tillage, as Brian said, it grows and grows and grows. So yeah, it's really tough to control without using a herbicide. Well, once again, an annual weed just lives for one year, a perennial for many years, and a biennial for two years. So what is our Weed of the Week this week, an annual, biennial, or perennial? Well, we'll tell you later in the show. Where we have run the soil warrior, we have harvested the best corn we have ever harvested in the history of Renwood Farms. Now, 
I'm kind of always wanting to push the envelope to see what else I can do to help enhance that emergence. The ride is so much smoother. Their seed placement is even better. Where we had our best emergence and we've had our best yields was where we ran the soil warrior. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy. All the way down to the last drop. Agroliquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. Pentair Hypro 3D nozzles are your premier choice for fungicide applications. Syngenta fungicide application field trials have shown Hypro 3D nozzles provide a yield advantage of up to 10% over other nozzles, maximizing the return on your fungicide investment. Learn more at pentair.com slash hypro. Make sure your farm equipment is season ready with an uptime inspection from your Titan Machinery service professionals. Titan Machinery's team of Case IH certified technicians has the knowledge and experience to find, correct, and prevent mechanical issues that could shut you down during the season. Your planting and harvest windows are short. For genuine Case IH parts and service, schedule an off-season uptime inspection at Titan Machinery today. Titan Machinery, your local Case IH dealer. More choices, more money. With Bayer Plus Rewards, you choose from our broad portfolio of high-performance products. Earn more money on the eligible products that are right for your farm. And use our new portal to see your purchases, track your rewards, and decide how you want to use them. Visit MyBayerPlus.com to sign in and start earning. That's the advantage of more control in your hands. That's the plus. Today we're going to talk a little about tassel applications in corn. So this could be anything from fungicide to insecticide, biologicals, or as we call them, natural products, maybe even some foliar fertilizer. What can you do and what should you do on your farm? Well, certainly at tasseling time, one of the things you're going to hear the most about is fungicide application. After this point, we have more issues historically with gray leaf spot, northern corn leaf blight, and a number of other diseases across the country. So. If you want to protect your corn, you need to be out in front of that with a fungicide application. Now here's a couple of things that I would mention. You've got a big tall corn plant now. It's reached its maximum height once you've hit that tassel stage. So you're looking at a lot of leaf area. Do you really need to cover the entire plant from top to bottom? I would argue, no you don't. At this point, you probably just want to make sure you're covering down to the ear leaf, but that's going to be a little ways down into the canopy those leaves from the ear leaf and up are really going to be important in determining your yield. So do check what's going on with your coverage to see how deep in the plant you're getting. The biggest problem I have with spraying a fungicide this late in the season is it costs a lot of money. You have to use the full rate. You're going to have to bring in either a plane or a high boy or something to get over the top of that tall crop. Is it going to pay for itself? In our geography in the western corn belt, typically it does not. When it does, is when we have a lot more rainfall. So the last two years we've had record rains in our region and when we sprayed fungicide it was phenomenal. I, I mean there was no question that was the absolute best thing we could possibly do. There are other areas of the country like Illinois, Iowa, Indiana where we see tassel applications pay almost all the time and the reason why is those diseases Darren mentioned. It's some terrible diseases that we fortunately don't typically face here in the western corn belt things like the northern corn leaf blight and gray leaf spot. Anyway, with fungicide applications at tassel, our advice to you is make sure you're using multiple modes of action and again use the full rate. There are new products out like Veltima, let's just say from BSF, Trivapro has been out for about three, four years now. Multiple mode of action products are the way to go. That way you beat resistance, you've got a more broad spectrum in terms of control and we do kind of like having a strobe in there too just because you can hopefully get some plant health benefits and by strobe I mean a strobilurin like headline quadra civito. Now the challenge here is the crop is big enough many operations aren't able to do that with equipment that they've got. They aren't able to do the application so they're going to hire in a helicopter or an airplane or something like that. 
If you're doing that, you may be thinking, wow, I'm gonna have to pay that guy eight bucks an acre or 10 bucks an acre. I wanna try and get as much done as I can. So how about considering some other options? One of the questions that we get a lot is, hey, should I just throw an insecticide in there? I'm already out spraying a fungicide. I've done that on soybeans historically and it's worked well for me because I generally have some soybean aphids or other pests out there. How about in corn? Well, I would say the exact same thing that I would say in soybeans or alfalfa or any other crop. If you're going to spray an insecticide, scout first get out in the field, take a look, see if there are any harmful insects. If there are no harmful insects in the field at all, there's no way I would recommend spraying an insecticide. However, if there are even low levels of harmful insects out there, like corn leaf aphids, for example, or if you see, hey, I'm starting to see some egg masses, great, add the insecticide into the package, there are a lot of good products that can be used. They're gonna have some residual for the next few weeks. I love how when Darren said, you see insect egg masses, great. <laughs> I'm going, what? That's not great at all. If you're already out there spraying a fungicide and you can throw an insecticide in though, that absolutely does help because now you don't have that extra cost for application. I would also tell you, consider throwing in a foliar fertilizer. That's what we do whenever we're going to make a tassel application. And again, we're not gonna do it every year in our geography, it doesn't always pay. We will pick the wetter years, that's when we found it has paid well to spray the fungicide. Then if we have harmful insects, sure, we're gonna throw insecticide in. But in terms of this foliar fertilizer, should you throw it in or not, I would tell you do pre-side dress nitrate tests or a soil test shortly before tassel. Also, do plant tissue analysis all throughout the growing season. If you're finding that, hey, week after week, I'm a little bit short on boron or I'm a little short on nitrogen or sulfur, then by all means, throw in just a little bit of that. You don't need a whole lot to get a little bit of yield gain. You haven't spent a lot of money. Hopefully that gives you a good ROI, especially when, in effect, the application cost is free. That money's already spent because you're out there spraying something else. Now you may also be considering putting in some sort of natural product. And Brian had mentioned nitrogen there. We hear a lot of different products out on the market today of things that could help bring more nitrogen into the plant. Now if you're looking to get higher test weight, higher protein in grain, these types of things, it helps to have nitrogen and sulfur available late in the season for that crop. So if you see, you know what, I can put a little nitrogen on now, but maybe I've got a light soil, or maybe I'm in a high rainfall area and I'm not sure that all that nitrogen's gonna stick around, maybe consider a natural for enhancing your nitrogen uptake or your nitrogen production. There's a lot of different products out there like in hydro and we hear of others. You can certainly do that at this timing as well. That'd be another thing where you just have to figure out what that product is, what they need to make it work, like good coverage, for example, and a proper amount of carrier to make that happen. Okay, so once again, tassel applications in corn absolutely can pay. It's just if we're talking fungicide, if you're not in an area of the country that has a lot of disease pressure, you're gonna have to look at what's my weather doing. If you've got a wetter year, we would tell you the odds are much better that fungicide's going to pay in a real dry year, probably not so much. On top of that, take a look at insecticide, potentially throwing in the tank, foliar fertilizer, and maybe even a biological or natural product. One thing that you're not taking care of though with a corn casting application is weed control. We'll show you what will stop this weed and when to do it coming up later in the show. Find love, and then give it all away. Find love, and give it all. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt and a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. Pentair Hypro 3D nozzles are your premier choice for fungicide applications. Syngenta fungicide application field trials have shown Hypro 3D nozzles provide a yield advantage of up to 10% over other nozzles, maximizing the return on your fungicide investment. Learn more at pentair.com slash hypro. 
wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you want. In your life and on your farm, Case IH AFS Connect gives you more control. Monitor your operation, manage your fleet and your farm data your way. Case IH, rethink productivity. Introducing the all-new Diamant Cornhead from Capello USA. With a revolutionary design highly innovative for its class, we have painstakingly designed every component down to the smallest detail to maximize your harvest efficiency. This gives you unprecedented standards in operation and performance. For more information about this beast, available only in our new gray poly, call 855-CAPELLO or visit capellousa.com to find a dealer near you. Capello, wherever you are, we are. When it comes to raising a crop on our farm, well, we raise one crop per season because we've got a short growing season. However, in many areas of the country and around the world, they have longer growing seasons and the opportunity to double crop. We're gonna focus on that second crop going into a double crop situation today. So a lot of times in the United States, we're talking about wheat followed by soybeans, but you may have any number of different crops as your first and your second crop. Whatever it is, I don't care. We just want you to focus on a few very important things. Let's start with fertilizer. When you're applying fertilizer for your first crop, this is usually what I hear from guys who are about to put in their second crop. They go, well, I don't really need to add any more fertilizer. I put enough in the first time. Did you really? Have you looked at the fertilizer removal charts? Are you properly fertilizing with each and every nutrient? Not just N, P, and K, but I also want you to think about sulfur, calcium, magnesium. Think about some of the micronutrients, zinc, boron, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, cobalt. There are a lot of different nutrients out there, and if you're short even a little bit, it's a big problem. So take a look at the nutrient removal charts or fertilizer removal charts that are out there and figure out how much did I actually pull off my soil with my first crop and what's my yield goal for the second crop. I would also say don't sell yourself short. Too often we talk to people who go, well, I'm just hoping for 20 or 30 bushel beans on my second crop. Why? What's limiting you? If you have moisture, then could it be fertility? Could it be something else? That's why we're talking about this today. We want you to maximize not just your first crop, but both crops. Well, it is really important to, to think about the fertility and what you're going to need to feed that crop, but what else could be feeding on your crop? Here's one of the things that we see too. We may see more insect pressure or we may see different types of insects. They just had a crop they were feeding on. You took the crop away. Did you take all the bugs away? Are they going to feed on the next seed that you're putting in the ground? I think it's really important to protect that next seed that's going in on this double crop situation. Protecting it from bugs is one of those things. And you're also gonna to have to think about disease. If you've got a crop that's out there, for example, it's wheat, and you may have had some diseases there and you say, you know what, I'm gonna go with a broadleaf crop now. I won't have those diseases. Yeah, that's fine. You may not have a grass disease, but you may have something else pop up. One of the things that really helps in terms of insects and diseases getting into the next crop is eliminating the green bridge. What we mean by that is if you have anything green growing out in that field for the week or two weeks prior to having that second crop come out of the ground or even planting the second crop, well, you know what? That provides a host for insects and for diseases. And then a lot of times it can carry over from the first crop all the way into that second crop. So by eliminating the green bridge, literally kill everything out in that field, have it black, or at least everything dead, for one to two weeks prior to seeding that second crop, you're going to be in better shape. Now I realize you can't always do that. Quite often I'll see combines and then right behind that, cedars. So we're going right into planting the second crop. And that's fine, you can certainly do that. But when you do that, just understand, like Darren said, you may have to invest a little bit more in seed treatment, in insecticide, in fungicide, because the odds are higher that you're gonna have more insect and disease issues in the second crop. Another very common question we get is about weed control. And it's normally starting with, you know, I wasn't expecting this, but I had to spray this in my first crop. Now I'm coming with my second crop and the rotational window may be two months, but I might be pushing that a little bit. How am I going to do? That's a great question. I have no idea and I certainly wouldn't recommend anything off label, but it is one of those concerns that you should have as you're putting that second crop in. If you had to make an adjustment to your herbicide program with that first crop that now could put the second crop in jeopardy, 
make sure you're talking with your agronomist about, all right, what are my options here and how can I improve my chances of having a successful second crop. Yeah, and maybe that means you have to plant a different crop. You can't plant soybeans anymore. You might have to put something else in the ground. Your herbicide choices with the first crop absolutely impact what you're going to do, at least for a while, if you've got residual herbicides. Now, as long as we're talking about herbicides, use something that has good residual now in the second crop that won't hurt your crop the following year, but will kill weeds this year. And the number one thing I'm gonna tell you is this. Look at your top two or three weeds and make sure that your modes of action do a good job on those. And then you've got to take a look at cost as well, certainly. But what we're really after here is we want multiple effective modes of action in terms of herbicide, and then you should be in pretty good shape in terms of weed control. And as you know, having great weed control means higher yields. You may not be intending to put a second crop out, but if you've got a lot of growing season left and you're already harvesting or getting close to harvesting the first crop that's in your field, we suggest you consider using a cover crop in your field just to keep something growing out in that field as long as possible. Once again, if you'll be raising a second crop this year, we would really encourage you do everything you can to maximize your return on that crop in addition to what you already raised this year. Well, if you want to have a great return in any crop, you've got to control weeds like our Weed of the Week. We'll tell you how to stop this tough weed coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift. And near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> is an annual weed, it's common cockleburr. This used to be one of the toughest weeds that we had to fight way back when Brian and I were younger and we would go out and hand pull this weed in the fields because we didn't have good herbicide options. Now I've got a lot of decent options, but I'll say this, there's nothing pre-emerged that you can do in any crop to completely stop cockleburr. It's a great big seed and it can germinate as deep as six inches. So when we're putting soil residual herbicides out there, you can't get a good concentration six inches deep that will kill that weed. Now, I don't know if you saw that, Darren was uh, showing you six inches and about a foot and a half. So that's, that, that's common when we talk with farmers. Oh, it's only six inches. We actually have seen cockleburr germinate from deeper than that. It, it was dramatic flare, weed. Brian, <laughs> right. for TV. That's but the, what the whole about. point is this, we can't get that concentration down, but you can still use a pre-emerge herbicide that will have at least a little bit of suppression on common cockleburr. I would suggest sharpen in wheat or in corn, in soybeans, python or pursuit, something like that would probably help. You could certainly use metribuzin as well. Well, in corn, post-emerge, I like the HPPDs plus about a half pound of atrazine if your rotation can tolerate it. In soybeans, I like pursuit and I like first rate in conventional beans. Otherwise, any of the herbicide tolerant options, the enlist and extend to max, those kinds of options are great. And Roundup. And when we get into wheat, Cockleburr is fairly easy to control. The wheat's gonna choke it out quite well. I like Husky the best. All right, the other thing that I will say is why we hate cockleburr so much is it's real easy for these little burrs to stick to clothing, to stick to animal fur, and that's how this weed gets spread. So we do see it all over the country, all over the world. If you have it, just get it under control quickly. It's pretty easy to control when it is small. That's all time we have for this week's weed, but Iron Talk is coming up next. How much does your crop residue cost you? Over time, residue accumulates in your fields, building excess carbon levels and tying up your plant available nitrogen. Residue also traps P, K, and micros and can take years to naturally become available to your crops. This is because soil lacks the diverse microbial life needed to break it all down. With Decomp, you can naturally restore life to your soil and allow the release of valuable crop fertility. 
Learn more about Decomp at eggbio.solutions. How much money are you leaving in the bin? If you want the most profit from your stored grain, you need the Grain Temp Guard from Farm Shop MFG. This low cost bin monitoring solution tracks temperature and humidity and gets your grain in ideal condition. And with deep preseason discounts on all Grain Temp Guard units, now is the best time to upgrade. Don't leave your money out in the bin. Get the most from your grain. Order today at farmshopmfg.com. It's no secret that Mother Nature doesn't always cooperate with your schedule. Field conditions in recent years kept many from timely planting and fertilizing. And when you can't get your fertilizer applied, you lose thousands of dollars in yield potential. If you need flexibility in your fertility application timing, you need a drop tube system from CNR Supply. CNR drop tubes allow you to apply liquid nitrogen in season and place it exactly where your crop needs it. To learn more about low cost CNR drop tube solutions, visit crsupply.com. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy, all the way down to the last drop. AgroLiquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you want, in your life and on your farm, Case IH AFS Connect gives you more control. Monitor your operation, manage your fleet and your farm data your way. Case IH. Rethink productivity. Are you pulling plant tissue tests on your farm this summer? We're getting lots of questions about how to fix some of the micronutrient deficiencies showing up across the country. Micronutrient application is the topic of today's Iron Talk. First of all, in most cases, you can utilize a highly available form of your desired micronutrient and get it into the crop with a foliar feed. Now, will it help you with your yield 100% of the time? Of course not. While a foliar application of micros is often a good idea, too often it comes after a deficiency has already been seen or has shown up on a test. This tells me you've already lost yield. To fix that situation long term, in most cases a soil applied solution between crops will do the trick and could be even cheaper. While you don't need many pounds of micronutrients to feed good crops, the challenge is the level of micros often varies across a field and you're only applying small amounts of them. The other challenge is you may be high in something like zinc and low in iron on one grid point and just the opposite in another. So how do you apply each one accurately? Variable rate application has just been a game changer. Ideally, you or your fertilizer dealer has a spreader with multiple hoppers to accomplish this. I'm not comfortable with blending micros with your NPK prescription as you can't vary their application and they're rarely the same density as the NP and K. Another alternative, especially with nutrients that you need just a small amount of, is to use liquid formulations. You can blend them with water to increase the volume enough to get a great spray pattern and coverage. Finally, it may take multiple trips across a field to apply micros one nutrient at a time if you want to vary the rate of a bunch of different nutrients. The good thing with micros is your crop won't take so many out of the ground that you need to do this every year. One application could be all you need for 10 or 20 years on micros like copper or manganese. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. That's all the time we have for today's show, but if you're looking for more agronomic information, we'd encourage you to check out the Ag PhD magazine. Just go to agphdinsider.com. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.